So we're now going to have a panel and I'll invite our panellists to come down. Now you have in the brochure everyone's bios so you can uh, read about them further. I think I'd like to stress that um, three of the panellists have actually been mentees of the Academy and this is part of the you know passing forward the wisdom from the senior members of the Academy to our mentees, but we're having our mentees give us our wisdom. When did you decide that you wanted to be a clinician scientist? And give us a three minute potted history of what you were thinking and when you did. So who would like to go first? We have a microphone. Okay. So I was at my very first consultant interview and I, there was a panel of 16. Like in WA you never get a panel that big but it was an enormous panel on the East Coast and I surprised even myself when I came out with a statement to the answer to a question, I would like to have a career that is 50-50, half clinician, half science. I hadn't even started a PhD yet and I was imagining it was like my strategy, my vision and I didn't even know that that was about to come out of my mouth. And now that's exactly what I do. So um, I... Sometimes those moments, you have to take note of them and go, oh, that's interesting. I didn't even realise that that's where my brain was going. But to get there, I had started as, with a Bachelor of Arts degree, then I did a, a, my medical degree. I then uh, completed paediatric infectious diseases training and absolutely love being an infectious diseases specialist. The thing that I love even more about being a clinician scientist and why I've trained myself to do that is that there's inordinate numbers of questions at the bedside. Every single day there are questions that we don't have the answers for, that we don't yet have the guideline for, we don't want know what the best practice is. And so our ability to see those questions and then be trained in a scientific way of thinking to run a clinical trial to actually answer that question, and that's not the only methodology you can use, but it's the methodology that I've chosen as a clinical trialist to go through. So I did my PhD up in the Northern Territory, actually in the most remote parts of Australia working with Aboriginal communities. And probably one of the hardest challenges to set myself, I didn't know it at the time, it was, it was so many challenges in my PhD that I was absolutely adamant two years after that statement in that consultant interview that I was never going to be a scientist or a researcher again. It was so hard and yet over the course of finishing my PhD, getting that work published, surprising myself once again, it got published in The Lancet somewhere where I didn't think it was going to end up because there'd been so many obstacles and challenges and over the last 10 years leading my research team through to remote Aboriginal um, community-based research through to the hospital, my hashtag is bush to bench to bedside and beyond and that's almost my strategy as well we're in the bush, we're in the lab, we're at the bedside and we're influencing guidelines nationally. So that's kind of been, I guess, a bit of the journey where I, when I decided how I've kind of got there as well as um, thinking about the ability constantly to just be training yourself to think differently, to break new ground, to figure out what that next big question is. And I'm sure I've done my three minutes. Thank you. All right, so it's a bit of a different story for me. I'm not actually a clinician. I'm a basic scientist, but I work very closely with many clinicians. Um, I started in a physiology department and really loved that basic science training that was the physiology department 20 years ago and how, um, yeah, doing experiment, you know, animal experiments and, and just learning, you know, about how the body worked from those really amazing professors um, and that the classes were really small, there were only 20 of us, the labs were eight hours long and I just really loved that environment and I think it's changed a lot now. The labs are probably all virtual or, you know, fake labs on a computer, they're not actually real labs anymore. But I really loved that and, and part of my journey also has been advocacy. So, you know, I wrote to the Chancellor or Vice-Chancellor and said, please don't change the labs. I think this style of education is really important. So all the way along, I've tried to, you know, advocate for what I thought was important, both at the education level, but also now with funding for research. So I started in the physiology department. I did my honours year in the physiology department. And during that time, I worked for a, um, early in the morning, isolating cells from guinea pigs for um, a, a researcher who was doing uh, cardiac research, Livia Hull. So I go in at 5 a.m. and isolate cells for her. So when she started at the, at her, her day after she dropped her kids at school, the cells were all ready for her experiments. And she then taught me a lot about what was really important, having a successful career 
as a researcher and finding the right mentor in the right lab and lab that was doing cutting edge research that was well funded. Um, and so um, I then heard about a person called Nigel Lang and I said to Livia, what do you think about this Nigel person? And she said, you should go and talk to Nigel. And that was probably the best decision I, I made. And without that sort of casual, um, casual research assistant job during honours, I would never have realised what was important going forward and could have ended up doing a PhD that was really not the best that I could have done. And so since then I've just stayed in the rare disease space, neuromuscular diseases, identifying genes that cause rare disease and uh, babies in utero that don't move properly, so fetal wake kinesias, and I've just really loved everything that I've done and, and the opportunities to train the next generation and work with colleagues around the world to tackle these rare diseases is, yeah, I have the best job in the world, I think. And even though it's hard and competing interests and I've got two small kids, yeah, the, the ability to combine career and family for me has been really good. And I think something else that um, Melissa stuck with me that Melissa Little said was that you have to pick your partners really carefully too. So I think having a really supportive partner who supports me in what I do is equally important to what what I do so you know he's come with me to conferences so that I can breastfeed the babies <laughs> when they were four months old so um, that is a really important career choice as well I think is if you're going to have a partner consider who your partner is yeah Fred uh, my my, my um, interest in uh, combining research with clinical practice came when I serendipitously uh, decided to, to uh, do a PhD so this was a time when I was doing fellowship in the UK and it was difficult as a fellow because you have to apply for a job that only lasts for a year. So I came across a job that lasts for three years, which is unheard of. And this was a combined research clinical work. And so I did a PhD at um, UCL uh, with, at, uh, at Morphew Eye Hospital looking at uh, techniques of cell transplantation. And I thought it was quite interesting uh, having to work with pigs at Northwick Park carrying blood and getting stopped by police at the police station, at the, the, uh, the uh, O3 station, and having to tell them what this bottle of blood was I was carrying. Uh, so I finished a PhD there and um, uh, learned the surgical techniques. And uh, um, like what Steve was saying, the laboratory and scientific understanding of basic research and animal research, and it brought it back to Perth, and then. Uh, interestingly, I guess that you know the, the work that we did was funded partially by Pfizer, and it was we, we knew there was no way we could do this kind of work because they gave us sixty million pounds to do that kind of research, and we weren't going to get that money in Perth. So then I have to branch out into different areas, and, and working in a clinic was critically important because I found a niche where patients were not diagnosed or treated, and that's the rare disease space. So my, my work predominantly work uh, is, is in the area of genetic eye disease, having great mentor from David Mackey, mentorship from David Mackey, and also uh, others in the clinic allow me to uh, develop my clinical skills in that area. Uh, and also now reaching out to collaborators on the East Coast and internationally can, uh, has allowed me to uh, broaden my um, understanding and also collaboration worldwide. And having a partner, especially uh, understanding and looking at the three kids for me while I'm working is also um, very lucky for me. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> And so I, I do you know, spend a bit of time in the playground, play the piano to get my mind off work, and that's uh, really quite helpful for me to continue my work. That's three minutes. So my uh, entry into being a clinician researcher was through a sliding doors moment. So I'm a local UWA medicine graduate and I did what was common at the time, my intern and resident year here and I went to the UK on my adventure. Um, and I uh, got jobs in oncology. So I worked at the Marsden and at Charing Cross, so wonderful oncology areas did my physician training in the uh, 
uh, physician exams in the UK and was accepted onto a temporary training position in oncology in the UK in the major London hospitals. At the time I was about to be awarded my formalised training number, there was an issue with my Australian um, uh, experience and I was suddenly told I wasn't eligible to, at that point, enter the training. Um, so I was completely devastated. Um, and then an ad came up for a Cancer Research UK fellowship at the Royal Free Hospital. Uh, I thought, well, I've got no job and no future prospect, so <laughs> I'm going to apply for whatever this is. Um, and I got the job and it was just incredible and changed everything. So this was a, um, a centre run by uh, an antibody therapy group. Um, it was clinical research based in oncology, but it integrated imaging. And it was all about understanding how new therapies work by what you can actually see and measure in clinical research, and particularly through imaging. And I worked with um, imaging, I radio-labelled antibodies, uh, but a lot of the work was phase one clinical trials very clinically focused, but I did all of the work looking at understanding, did we deliver the antibody, did it get there in a sufficient amount, and there was an early PET scanner that I was involved with, and I did a lot of research in that. It was incredible. I had my first child there, had wonderful mentors, um, and then at the end of that, I was accepted onto the formalised training program in oncology in London, uh, but for family reasons, moved back to Australia, um, and, uh, and then I had to repeat my physician exams because uh, qualification in the UK at that time was not accepted in Australia. Um, and had my second child and fortunately got a uh, position um, as a job share with another person in, in this area of nuclear medicine, which, you know, I'd done a little bit on in my research. And at that time, we actually had our first cyclotron and our, at that time, until now, our only cyclotron in Western Australia in 2003 and our first PET camera. And so I actually completed training in nuclear medicine, um, did not go on and do oncology, stayed in nuclear medicine, um, and subsequently have been a combined clinician researcher in imaging, um, including head of department in nuclear medicine for 10 years, um, extensive research, including setting up uh, a national uh, clinical trials um, network in nuclear medicine throughout Australia as well. So sometimes you can have a sliding doors moment uh, where you are completely devastated by your career direction, but to me, it actually opened up incredible opportunity. Thank you all very much. Um, it's a lot of serendipity with everyone's careers here. Um, so, you know, how to plan it is a bit hard to, you know, give that advice. But one area I'd like to ask a little about is how do you find and you know, pick good mentors and are you actually acting as mentors at the moment? I might as well start and then I'll hand back. Um, so I think for me, I and I've heard this recurring through some of the things that people have said. I mean, I was very much influenced by my first um, professor, who was my supervisor, who really taught me a lot about good quality research, about the value of data, about um, the way you design trials and the data you collect as being so critically important, and also about transparency of data. So if I was to analyse something, um, that uh, result should be the same if someone else followed my technique, so it should be reproducible as well. Um, and also about sharing data. So that was instilled in me very early on. So I think that mentorship from being in a very good unit and having strong mentors was important. And yes, I've tried to also provide mentorship. So I've had several PhD students um, developing a research team uh, yeah, from scratch in Western Australia because the first PET unit and cyclotron coincided with my return to Perth. And so have developed the research team from scratch. I agree, I think getting the right people, um, have giving opportunities to combine clinical work. So there are three um, clinician scientists or um, clinicians who did PhDs whilst doing their clinical work um, that I've helped mentor as well and have very much tried to pass on those principles of good quality research. Uh, I, I chose my mentor through, uh, I guess, just the ads because I, I didn't really know who to choose. But the mentors, I was fortunate that the mentors I had, Lyndon de Cruz and Pete Coffey, were, were extremely supportive. Uh, coming back to Perth, uh, had luckily David's my mentor uh, for, for many years. 
And currently, I am ment mentoring um, a couple of scientists, and they are also mentoring students as well. So I do pass uh, the mentorship responsibility to my my team. And it's important that you know by them mentoring others, they actually learn more. So I, I, I think it's important that we're not just as mentors, but we also train other mentors as well. Yeah, so I guess I sort of found Nigel through serendipity, through working with Livia, but you also sometimes, you know, make your own success. So I, I chose to take on that job that was a bit scary during honours, you know, working at 5am to isolate guinea pig cells to uh, as a job while I was doing honours, you know, that was something that I chose to do and so perhaps, you know, the things happen for reasons and, and you can make your own success sometimes as well. Um, you know, in a research lab you do, you mentor the people under you. I'm also really passionate about, in science, I, I don't know how it is in medicine, but there's not much talk still about different career opportunities for undergrads. So when I give a lecture and there should be 100 people in the room but there's only 10, I say, you know, if you send me an email and you want to go for a coffee to talk about careers as a scientist and options for when you finish your degrees, you know, contact me. And so I keep, you know, keep getting emails from people who, who, where they really don't know what they want to do or what their options are. So I think it's really important to start that young, to start that really early on in people's careers um, in terms of helping mentor them. Um, and I think now as a, a sort of junior group leader and a female, there's not that many women group leaders around and so there's a bit more peer mentoring now as well I think you know um, Twitter and social media are great so you can reach out to people over east and sort of share anxieties and issues and sort of all help mentor each other um, and do this sort of peer mentoring rather than necessarily looking to some of the people above me because there's some people above me that I don't really want to be mentored by at the institute so I think you've got to find the people that that you do want to to mentor, you know, be mentored by and, and who share your world views and things. So, yeah. A solid advice coming across from everyone. Um, I was just going to say, you don't need often just one mentor. Often you need people in different domains who can help guide you and um, they may change over the course of your career. So being open to new relationships and getting to know new people and asking, I think Steve mentioned this, but just asking people and most people are flattered to be asked to be a mentor. If they say no, then that's their issue, not yours. Um, and you've you've got an answer so you can move on. Um, I think peer mentoring is a really great um, opportunity and I have been involved in um, seeking out, um, I had a very serendipitous conversation with Fiona Stanley and she was telling me about group mentorship that she was doing and I was like, well, that sounds fun. I'm going to get a group of women together and let's become a peer mentor group. And we had many a, a coffee around her kitchen table just chatting and it was really, really valuable. And so now I've constructed all of my honours UWA MD students who have completed a project with me are now junior doctors and want to become paediatricians. They're my mentor group and so we have dinner maybe once a year, maybe twice a year and talk about the issues that they have. And so it's, it's kind of like that pay it forward business. The other thing I would say is that I put in so many mentorship applications because I really wanted a female mentor. And um, Karen gave us the numbers, eight out of, was it 178 people in a leadership course? So when people like Gina and myself and Rosalind are looking for a female mentor, there are actually very few of them. And they're very busy and they're pulled in many directions. And so, um, oversubscribed is <laughs> a great word. And so I was reaching out constantly asking for this and eventually have found um, a really great suite of different mentors who help in different ways. But I did have to keep asking and keep looking and keep searching because it just wasn't, they weren't always on the panel of opportunities. They might not have actually been asked to be on it as well. So the people who are asking to be a mentors may actually be inhibited by some of the gender bias that still exists in science. And they're not being put forward into those opportunities as well. So keeping on asking, keeping on looking. And I have absolutely tried my hardest to look out for future female clinician scientists doing work with girls in science, thinking about primary school, high school, um, medical school or university, undergraduate university and thinking about different ways that you can get involved and mentor in those particular opportunities and keeping on building that experience and sharing your journey. Looking, I think I was looking out for people who are future clinician scientists who are females who are just starting their families um, because that's a really, really tricky time for most women to, to navigate and how can you um, provide some advice? How can you tell about your mistakes? How can you be really authentic about sometimes you're just going to be in a 
puddle of tears and that's okay? And how can you, um, you know, pave a way so that it's easier for them as they come through that they won't encounter some of the hurdles that you might have as well? So lots of different, I think, approaches to mentorship from all of us. And really great advice from everyone. Something everyone's mentioned is this issue of connections with people internationally around Australia and in the big isolated country town of Perth, how do you build and maintain national and international collaborations? I think this is a critical piece of um, excellence in science and I think we've talked a little bit about social media and I think that has opened up lots more opportunities for all of us to connect with like-minded people. You can put your ideas out there, see what comes back and that sort of thing. You can also be targeted and under a huge amount of pressure to become more in the advocacy stream and I saw this personally in COVID. Every single time I said something about COVID in kids got absolutely smashed and still sometimes do. If something, an award I receive, someone will then come back and smash me about my opinions and advocacy on COVID in kids. So you have to be prepared to be, I think Karen was talking that about as well, you have to be prepared that if you are going to um, advocate, then you have to be prepared that there may be some, um, some backlash. But I think social media helps. I think we were really, really um, challenged by being on the West Coast during COVID with our borders closed and we got forgotten. And we might have been in those Zoom meetings, but we just weren't being as involved in all of the scientific decision making, particularly for me as an infectious diseases specialist around COVID, we were um, just not being considered. And so it's really important now to be looking and traveling a lot just to be in the room be present, be in the conversation, be discussing things because that is where future, I guess, collaborations are going to happen, future grant opportunities. But being aware that our closed border really did have an impact on us and our grant opportunities. And so now it's our job to just get on that next flight and um, be in the room, be present so that you can be part of the conversation. Thanks, yes, yeah, so I, I agree with everything. Um, for rare disease research, it really is collaborative because you have to work with everyone else who's working on those same cohorts of patients. So by definition, it's really collaborative and, and that's one of the things I love most about my area of research. Um, in WA, I think we run the risk of always going to international conferences and maybe not prioritising national meetings. And we need to prioritise the national meetings because the people on the East Coast make the decisions about who get the grants. And I agree, we have to be in the room. So tomorrow, you know, I've been invited to um, meet with the Federal Health Minister Monday morning for three hours to discuss the MRFF NHMRC consultation and alignment of funding. And they said you could attend by Zoom, but I've prioritised getting on a plane tomorrow morning to be there so that, you know, there might not be that many people from WA in the room. There might not be that many mid-career researchers in the room and women in the room and basic scientists in the room. So I've said this is an important thing that I want to be there. And so I agree, we have to, we have to be in the room. You have to show up. Um, th three things, I guess. Uh, one is uh, co-supervision of PhD students will be mm. quite useful to, to share that burden with somebody on the East Coast and, and elsewhere. And that will allow collaboration, not just sharing data, but sharing ideas, co-authoring co with mm -hmm. others. Second thing is, um, uh, grants. I mean, we, we like to pull all the monies here if we can, but that's not possible all the time. So having been on grants led by other states or including other states elsewhere as uh, PIs. And finally, um, what I do is I go to Melbourne every four weeks to do a clinic and that really helps because uh, you're not just just you know, seeing patients, you're talking to the people there, working with the scientists and they see your face every four weeks. They, they think you're part of them. <laughs> not not realising actually you're not. <laughs> so, and so that helps. So I think um, for collaboration, I suddenly found when I came from the UK back to Perth, I was a little bit naive and uh, believed everywhere was like London. And um, someone gave me some good advice, which was to... Um, 
collaborate with people that obviously are well aligned with what you want to do in an area of interest you want to do, but where there is a particular strength in Perth and so we can add value in that area because it's sometimes very difficult in Perth to compete internationally with these big, well-funded, massive groups. So if there's a particular area that is done very well and you can align with it and add value to that research, then I think you have a real opportunity in that collaboration. Now, you need to add some value yourself to that collaboration to be seen um, as contributing, but you also have to make sure that those you collaborate with are also going to make that contribution. So you do need to be a little strategic with it. So when I came back um, from Perth, I was given the advice, you know, to to, to work on an area that we do particularly well in WA, and in fact that was mesothelioma research because we have the highest per capita incidence in the world. So I worked collaboratively with some uh, fantastic people, Anna Nowak, who many people will know, uh, Michael Byrne, who was an amazing um, oncologist and uh, researcher, and also Bruce Robinson. And so I still work with that group 20 years on um, in collaboration, and I try and add value in the aspect that I add. Um, I completely agree, nationally and internationally, you actually need to go in person. Um, you do need to attend the conferences. I find um, it's it's something also that's highly rewarding. You, you develop these relationships with like-minded people, you get a buzz, you have ideas, and it really does happen when you do that in person. Um, and so I would strongly encourage putting yourself out there. And it's actually one of the fun aspects of being a clinician researcher. I think I must suffer from um, issues with um, doing too much of the same thing. I could not sit in a room, a dark room, and report scans for the whole of my life. I have to add some variety. And so part of that is the fun you get from going from a conference, hearing an idea, bringing it back, following it through, um, or establishing a relationship. So, um, but, you know, it's something you need to put yourself out there to do, but you'll, you'll get value from it. Thank you. So I think really the message there is you need to be in the room where it happened. Who knows where I've taken that quote from? Okay, how many of you have seen Hamilton? Okay, it's been on for the last, you know, three years in Australia, you know, but hardly anyone in Perth gets to see it. So we're isolated and we're not being in the room where it happened, so you miss out. So it's not just going to the conference, I think, you know, when I'm going to a meeting, I'm going to the Academy Council meeting and I'm visiting my collaborators at QIMR, I'm going to a paediatric ophthalmology meeting, I'm catching up with family and then coming back after a week being away, not doing a fly-in, fly-out, half-a-day meeting and come back. So I think one needs to really look at that. If you want to be the best in the world, you've got to be out there in the world. So moving on. Are there any questions the audience would like to ask? Yep. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about, so you've mentioned a lot about travelling to be there for meetings and conferences and all that, but something that I've noticed amongst pretty much everyone that's spoken is they have some sort of training in another country, whether that's the UK or somewhere else. Um, is that an important part if you want to have, um, I don't know, a very successful career or one where you're collaborating with lots of people to also have some sort of formal qualification, a PhD or something that was done outside of WA? Well, we've actually got diversity within our group. So, you know, I think there's no right or wrong answer, but I'll let the panel talk about that? Yeah, I agree. There's no right or wrong answer and sometimes it just depends on um, opportunity uh, and I think where you want to go with your career. Um, I made that decision because I felt when I was a junior doctor there were opportunities to work overseas and I didn't know that would end up being seven years in the UK. I went for a year or two and ended up seven years with a child and a PhD. So, you know, life happens um, and I think, you know, you have to follow an opportunity that seems right for you. There are plenty of excellent researchers in Perth, in Australia, um, but there's also amazing opportunities if you travel to see other healthcare systems the way things work. I think I, I learnt a lot um, 
not just from, I mean, I was fortunate in the group that I was, but they could be anywhere in the world, but I learnt a lot about a different healthcare system um, and the way things are done. Um, and often Australian trained doctors are well received all around the world. So it's not a have to, it's if you want to um, follow that dream and you never know where it might land. Yeah, I agree. It's um, For me, I, I really didn't intend to stay in the UK. I wanted to go to the US to do fellowship. But, but going overseas is not just about training, it's also living there, um, seeing another medical system. My son was born there, and that was a terrifying experience. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but, um, but having links there, but because you're already there, I was in the UK for four, almost five years, I got to know all the people there, and, and it's much easier now to communicate with them because you were there. But, you know, they are equally great... Um, scientists and clinicians train here and then go on overseas and come back. There, there's no right timing and no right place to be, really. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm different again. I didn't go away. I stayed in the same lab that I did my PhD in and every fellowship I applied for, people said, you're not going to get this fellowship because you haven't left and you're not independent and I still get that comment. But so far, it's been okay, and Nigel's going to retire, so then it'll be okay, right? Because he'll, he'll fall off the papers. Um, yeah, so for me, it was quite different, and now I actually feel like I missed out on that opportunity. I didn't want to go to the US because of things I'd heard about the way the US works in, in science and how competitive and nasty it can be. And I really wanted to go to Italy, and I went and visited some labs in Rome and near Venice, and... The funding situation there was even more strange than in Australia. It seemed like the mafia controlled some of the money. <laughs> no one could tell me where the grants came from or how you applied for them or what you earned. It was really strange. Um, so I decided to stay. Um, and then I, you know, my husband got married, had kids. But now I'm looking at maybe, and I think COVID showed us this, that you don't have to be in a building the whole time for your research to keep happening. Mm. And maybe I can go away for three months or six months to somewhere in the Netherlands, one of the big genomic centres, put the kids in school there for a term or two and have that experience That's now, later. The, the wonderful concept of the sabbatical that we need to ensure the universities and the health system continue to promote because it is really important to keep those interactions going. And again, when do you do your PhD? When do you do your travel? There's no right or wrong answer. Do what happens. I, I think that's absolutely right. I would say right now there are amazing research groups in WA that every single one of you would have the opportunity to get involved in. So you could do probably 500 different PhDs right now on offer with all of the science going on right in our backyard. But there's also, I think science is amazing because it allows you to travel and it actually... <laughs> We've talked a little bit about you almost forced to travel to be in the room to talk to people and that sort of thing. My experience was that I went to the Northern Territory from Sydney. I trained and lived in Sydney for most of my life and I moved up there and I thought this was my due diligence as an Australian to find out a little bit more about Aboriginal health. I thought I could go there for six months, I could work in the microbiology lab and then do some work in um, the remote communities and then follow my passion, which was HIV. And I absolutely passionately all of my first papers were in HIV I really wanted to be an HIV researcher and a golden opportunity came up in the Northern Territory to lead a clinical trial in Aboriginal health and that became my thing and I've loved being mentored by Aboriginal people the elders who have supported me and um, taught me many many things about how to work with them and to support um, the capacity building that's required to actually change the story of uh, broken and busted in this country that we have actually imposed as non-Aboriginal people. It's a story that needs to be changed and I have learned that by being still here in Australia but actually focusing on something different about the healthcare system. And so that has been, uh, I think, a really important part. I also, at the end of my PhD, really tried hard to get a postdoc in HIV medicine again and tapped my entire global network to see what was out there and see whether I could pivot from what I was doing into something else. But the very last paper of my PhD that I wrote was a systematic review. And everyone says you've got to do your literature review first. That's nonsense. You can do it whenever you can because serendipity happens. And in that paper, I discovered by systematically reviewing the burden of a very simple condition, skin sores, 
that Aboriginal children had the highest burden in the world and it was so far above any other similarly impoverished setting that I then had a cause and something to work on. And that is a key driver of rheumatic fever. And the next decade of my work has really been about the advocacy as well as trying to change that trajectory um, and to really reduce that burden. So it's as though sometimes the location chooses you and sometimes you choose the location, but there's, with as a scientist, the curiosity drives the discovery, the discovery drives the next step, and that, I guess, drives the next question and it just keeps on going in that direction. So I don't think it matters at all where you're located. I think that um, following your sort of your footsteps and where your um, passions lie is really helpful. And we've all had different experiences and we've all come out the other side leading research groups, mentoring the next generation, um, establishing national international collaborations. And then you've obviously heard from even more senior people about how they've done it as well. So I, I, I don't think it matters at all. <laughs> okay. Brilliant advice from everyone. Actually, a question? Hi, just an open question to the panel. Just wondering if anyone has any advice on balancing research and training for registrars, where there's like a full-time clinical load and then you spend your evening studying for fellowship exams and things. Like, is there a, a role for research there? Or is that something that just gets put on the back burner for a couple of years? That's a, such a great question. I'm happy to have a crack at it. I think that the um, when you're in your research years, I mean, sorry, when you're in your registrar years, uh, you usually have to perform a college project. And one, in my training, it was three college projects. And so that actually was the entry point to getting a bit of a track record in research and seeing if I liked it. And so using your college projects in that way. But we've now got some amazing fellowships in WA where um, there's a, a pathway to sort of a 2080 split, then an 8020 split for three years, and then 2080 at the end. So a five year program to get your PhD and fellowship training. Obviously, they're, they're rare but they now exist, so there's opportunities to do some of those things more effectively. I do think as clinicians, there is an enormous expectation that we will be excellent in our clinical roles, but in order to create the careers that we want and the opportunities that we want, we have to go and above and beyond in our personal time in terms of studying for exams, in terms of getting involved in research. There's not a whole lot of space for that in the, um, say we think of ourselves as working a 37 and a half working hour week. Um, everyone just kind of laughs because that's not, what who, that's not what we do, that's not what the career that we're in, which is a 24 seven industry. And it requires particularly of registrars in that training mode to be learning to be a consultant. Um, there's absolutely ways to do research in there, but um, I think the system favours or is more um, constructed towards registrars getting their registrar ticket to become a consultant and then choosing to add research in. So it's a system that's built that way. There's not a reason you can't disrupt it, but it's going to be harder to do some of the other um, pathways, but I've definitely seen registrars over the last few years achieve it and do magnificent PhDs whilst also completing their training. And I know some departments are really well set up for that, others you create the opportunity. So I think it's a bit of and or and again kind of thing. It's, it's possible, but there are some structural barriers that make it a little bit harder to in, get your research in there. And if you want a 37 and a half hour working week, I'm really sorry, but you're in the wrong industry. <laughs> Probably in the wrong room right now. <laughs> Could, sorry, <clears throat> Michelle, can I just add something to that? Can we give you a microphone? Sorry, Fred. Uh, it used to be easier, in fact, because there were no funded training positions in paediatrics, for example, and they were funded by research funds. And so your mentors and supervisors actually provided the money for your training, and in return, you worked on, on research projects that gave you an opportunity to do a PhD. It meant that your training was longer, but it, uh, it meant that you, you were virtually coerced into doing research. Uh, and for many people, that changed their lives. Similarly, I, to do my paediatric ophthalmology training, I had to do a research project at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, which I turned into my MD. Okay. 
guess it depends on the training program. Some training programs are heavy on on the on calls and after hours. So for me, in that three years of training, it was three years. Those that there was zero zero output, <laughs> and, and so the output was of before or after. And so then I chose to do a PhD after when I couldn't decide, and, and because the job description was that it's a half time research, half time clinical, then I could then start that career. Um, so there are different ways of doing it. Yeah, I don't think I have a lot to add, except obviously when I was in the UK, you really couldn't get a position as a consultant oncologist without a PhD, and so it was very much integrated into your training, and it is, I was surprised, I guess, coming back to Australia, that it actually was more difficult, and I found you have to do it in series, so um, I myself did my PhD, then my Australian physician exam and then my training program and um, similarly for one of my PhD students, the two others did their um, fellowship specialisation and then the PhD. But it seems to be more common in series unless you can do a program like you mentioned which actually sounds fantastic and I wish there was more of that because integrating would actually be better to be honest. So it would be great to have more, more advocacy for those programs. Ultimately, we're integrated people, and um, I think all of the talks this morning have talked about, you know, how we balance everything and juggle it and um, have a strategy and that sort of thing. But uh, I think advocating for more of the types of um, fellowships where you can do your training and your research and come out at the other end as clinician scientist is really important. And Steve's absolutely right that when there was no funding, uh, specifically for the positions, it was somewhat easier in paediatrics particularly to create research opportunities and that's probably what's driven some really great research departments that, like um, Karen was talking to as well. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't do it now. It's just the um, like we have to keep on thinking about the environment we're working in and how we modify it to create the opportunities that are going to be best suited to the future workforce that we need. And I think trying to do both at the same time is absolutely well um, regarded. I definitely did mine in serial as well. So I did finished all of my training and then did my PhD and then picked up a consultant role. Um, and so that was what was on offer at the time in terms of what I could cobble together in terms of funding. But there, I think everyone's story is so different. So ask around how did people do it and then dig into the questions. But how did you get that funded? And who had to approve that? And how did you find a good mentor? Um, those are the kind of questions you need to be asking because they're the answers you'll be able to pursue um, something that will work for you. Can I actually ask a question on funding? How long did it take you to get your first big research grant? And how much effort is all of that? asking everyone? That's a great question. I think um, I will say my first, I would call my first big research grant was a NHMRC project grant and I was awarded my PhD in May 2015 and in May 2015 I also met with the Minister for Health of WA and that was a serendipitous moment where the Minister for Health had an interest in skin health and clinical trials. And those were the, for the exact two things that I had trained in. Um, <laughs> I'd written an excellent paper, four page paper for the Minister for Health and the Director General. And these are the only two times I've ever been invited into their office and have a conversation. Complete serendipity. So I was there and they hadn't read anything I'd written, but the minister came up with and said, I really want a clinical trial in skin health. And everyone looked across at me and they're like, that's what she does. And so that was a million dollars that came through it took a lot of pain and politics to get it, but that's another story. But it was a foundational piece that led to a project grant that I had to get because I wasn't going to get the million dollars unless I got more money because it was a $3 million project. So I had to bring in the other $2 million to receive the $1 million, but it was that kind of um, serendipitous moment, being in the right place at the right time with the right skills that no one could have predicted was about to happen. And so it, it does sound a bit like the mafia. It wasn't, I don't think, some people perceived it that way, but I think um, it built a foundation for NHMRC success and um, building of that track record. Meantime, I had an NHMRC track record because I had an NHMRC funded PhD and had achieved an NHMRC early career fellowship. So I had some of those personal fellowship track records, but to get that first big grant where you can build a team, um, had some serendipity as well as um, 
being there with the right skills at the right time and just um, running with it as fast as we possibly could. It felt like the Flintstones in a, um, a I guess, a, a stone car, not really knowing what I was doing, running with my feet going like this and just trying to keep up with the action to make it happen. And that clinical trial is about to um, report and, cl and um, finish. It's had many, 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 many challenges, but it's going to be um, a really important one for WA. Yes, yeah, so I think my first, uh, depends what you call big grant, but, you know, my first grant, I suppose, was from the RAIN Priming, uh, from the RAIN Foundation. And there's lots of, well, there's not that many, but there's the RAIN Foundation through the medical school. Um, and then some of the hospitals have little um, research foundations that you can get grants from if you're a hospital um, employee, uh, a health department employee. So those are always great places to start out, I think, are those smaller grants. And then for me, I was sort of uh, not the chief, the main chief investigator, but one of the middle chief investigators on NHMRC grants and then got my, fellow, my first fellowship from the NHMRC a couple of years after my PhD and then I've had two more since then. And now, you know, NHMRC and MRFF grants are CIA and, you know, leading teams. And, and most of our grants that have been successful have been ones where we've had co-investigators from the East Coast and so not trying to do it alone, but to lead them from here, but have key collaborators in Melbourne, Adelaide, Sydney on the grants as well. Yeah. About, about one in four to one in five grants I've written, I've received uh, awards. So the first one would have been a small one probably two to three years after I came back. Um, like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, but then the uh, fellowship I got, which is funding the person's salary, is, uh, was about four or five years from when I came back. And the big, bigger ones are like group, like a program or research grants, project grants, was about seven, eight years later. So it wasn't quick, but you just got to keep writing it, otherwise you never get one. <laughs> Yeah, so I would say my most um, significant first grant, which, which was a collaborative grant, was in 2015. Um, and this was um, an imaging grant. So getting funding for imaging studies um, has been, you know, very difficult. Um, and this was a new imaging test which had come out across the world initially in Europe, a new imaging test for prostate cancer. And it was starting to infiltrate in Australia. And a group of us got together and said, um, you know, we need to know, is this imaging test going to impact on the care of patients and how will it improve the care of patients? So uh, we got together and put in an expression of interest for a Prostate Cancer Foundation Australia multi-million dollar grant for an imaging test to look at um, uh, this in a newly diagnosed men with intermediate and high risk prostate cancer. Um, and we were successful with that. Um, it ended up that one of the investigators from Peter Mac was the primary investigator and I was the secondary investigator, but what we actually did was set up 10 sites across Australia to perform, to radio label this agent and perform imaging in a harmonised way and that was my role, was to set all of that up. Um, we recruited um, six months ahead of target, uh, it was a very impactful publication clearly showing this imaging test was better than existing imaging with CT and bone scan um, and not only that it improved outcomes for men, published in The Lancet, adopted into international guidelines in um, 2021 and is since uh, July last year is now funded for all men in Australia with newly diagnosed prostate cancer. So for me, that was the most impactful, but it was impactful because in Australia, we produced the only prospective clinical trial of this imaging agent in this particular patient group, um, done at 10 sites, all in the same way. Um, it's the only one done internationally and we showed we could work together. So for me, that highlighted the power of collaboration and the impact of your research if you work together. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's so inspirational listening to you. And when we talk about mentoring, I love being a mentor because I hear all of these great stories and ideas and I learn so much from it. So we're going to have the one-on-one um, -on -one discussions after the one-hour lunch break. And if you sign up after we finish off, I'm going to hand back to Tim to end everything. And I'd like to give a huge round of applause to our four people.